Mr. Purcell? Yes, Your Honor. May it please the court. I'm Washington State Solicitor General Noah Purcell on behalf of the states of Washington and Minnesota. Your Honors, it has always been the judicial branch's role to say what the law is and to serve as a check on abuses by the executive branch. That judicial role has never been more important in recent memory than it is today. But the President is asking this court to abdicate that role here, to reinstate the executive order without meaningful judicial review, and to throw this country back into chaos. The court should decline that invitation. Uh, this afternoon, I'd like to first discuss why the court should reject defendant's motion on jurisdictional grounds, and then explain why, even if the court does consider the motion, uh, the court should reject it on the merits. So starting with appealability, defendants have pursued the wrong remedy by seeking a stay in this court uh, rather than mandamus. Of course, uh, so defendants have filed a notice of appeal and then a motion for stay this pending appeal. This is Judge Clifton. Why should we care? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, for, is it for your two position reasons. A, a district court, suppose a district court issued an order requiring all the public schools in the state of Washington to be closed because of some concern about a flu epidemic and did it in the form of a TRO and said the TRO would only last uh, less than 14 days. Are you suggesting mandamus is the only form of relief available? Well, I first want to answer why you should care, if you don't mind, before, uh, because I do think it makes a big well, difference I mean, for two I, I, reasons. You're basically saying we shouldn't look at it, and it's hard to me to envision uh, an order this sweeping that shouldn't be subject to some kind of appellate oversight. Your Honor, I'm not, I mean, I'm not just, at all saying that you shouldn't look at it. Uh, not at all. Uh, I'm just, you've got a sorry. TRO that by its terms, I mean, we've, we've now received the proposed schedule and the district court has entered it in order, so we know already that this TRO is going to stay in place for more than the 14 days contemplated by Rule 65. So why shouldn't we view this as an injunction? Well, for several reasons, Your Honor. Uh, first of all, in the cases where this court has treated a TRO as an injunction, uh, the, the timeline of the order was vastly longer. Uh, in the SEIU case that the, the defendants have cited, the order lasted four months. Here, the order will be fully, the district court explicitly called the order a temporary restraining order, ordered a very quick, uh, ordered the parties to confer and agree on a briefing schedule, and briefing will be complete within 14 days of the entry of the order. It could have been completed faster if the government hadn't filed this appeal and forced, <laughs> and forced us to spend quite so much time on this. Uh, well, and, and the judge, I'm sure. Time today as you want, but I'd suggest that this might not be the topic that's most important. But I'll fair enough, Your Honor. I would just say, that. mandamus. The only point I'd make is that mandamus does allow review. It's just an extremely strict standard. And the important point also is that if the court treats this as an appealable order, then that's what the ultimate appeal of this of this of the ultimate ruling will be of. Whereas if the court properly treats this as a mandamus decision and sends it back to the district court the district court will have the opportunity to enter a more full preliminary injunction uh, when the district court understands that it, that's what it's doing, when that's its intent, and that will be what the court can ultimately review, as opposed to reviewing what the court clearly intended to be a temporary restraining order. In uh, so view, I will... This judge can be, in your view, if we left this uh, order in place, would there then be a preliminary injunction hearing in the district court? Absolutely, Your Honor. Absolutely. The, the, the parties have agreed to a briefing schedule. The, uh, the preliminary injunction motion will be fully briefed by a week from Friday. Uh, I'm confident that Judge Robart will schedule, uh, will, will, rule, uh, will schedule a hearing and rule quickly after that. I'd also point out that the 14-day limit is for ex parte uh, temporary restraining orders by its text. Uh, this one, no, it's part not. of the problem with... Well, part of the problem with treating this as a temporary restraining order, Your Honor, is that if, 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 if the defendants are right that any time uh, the court enters a temporary restraining order after a hearing and, and receiving briefing, uh, it's treated as a preliminary injunction, that's, that's a terrible rule to create for district courts because it, it, it discourages them from hearing from the other side before entering a temporary restraining order. But, but Your Honor, I do, I do certainly want to move on to the merits. I don't want to spend uh, all your time on this. Uh, and, and, of course, uh, the, if, if this is treated as a motion for stay, uh, we obviously still believe that the court should reject that motion. And, and the most simple basis for that, of course, would be the lack of irreparable harm. I heard Your Honors again pressing uh, counsel for a statement of what the irreparable harm is and still no clear um, 
factual claims or evidentiary claims of what that irreparable harm would be from a stay. And in fact, it was the executive order itself that caused irreparable harm to our states, to Washington and Minnesota and our residents, and to many other states and people, as, uh, as described in the many amicus briefs that have been filed. Uh, so, so, of course, we believe that, that the federal government has shown no irreparable harm from reinstating the, uh, the status quo prior to the executive order. What's the, the, the harm to the state of Washington? From the executive order? Uh, well, we detailed a number of irreparable harms, Your Honor. We had students and faculty at our state universities who were stranded overseas. We had families that were separated. We had, uh, we had uh, longtime residents who could not travel overseas to visit their families without knowing that they would be uh, able to come back. Uh, we had lost tax revenue. We had... Uh, if, if we uh, don't agree with your parents' patriot theory, then in balancing the harms and thinking about the standards for a stay or for a TRO, are we limited to looking at the proprietary interests of the state itself, or can we look beyond that, even if we reject the parents' patriot theory, or do you need the parents' patriot theory to expand the, the harms that we can consider? I don't think the parents' patriot theory is essential, Your Honor. We've argued two independent grounds for standing. One, the proprietary harms that we're suffering, and one, the parents' patriot. So, so the court right, has so certainly say we agree with the proprietary theory for standing. Does that have uh -huh. any implications for what we can then consider when considering the factors for a TRO and for a stay? Or, or is it just a way to get standing and then we can consider anything in the public interest that affects the public interest? I think it would primarily just go to standing, Your Honor, because I think the harms well, I mean, maybe you would then consider the harms, the other harms in the balancing of equities and the public interest factor of the test, I suppose, as opposed to in the, in the standing test, but certainly those harms would not become irrelevant. Uh, so, so, and again, the, uh, it's, it's now, at this point, it's, it's really the federal government that's asking the court to upset the status quo. Uh, we've, you know, things have slowly gone uh, are, are returning to normal to to the situation before the chaos of the executive order, and and it's the it's the federal government that's asking the court to upend that uh, that status quo again. And uh, your honors, I, so, uh, I think it's fair. Counsel uh, for the government uh, repeatedly sort of tried to limit the nature of our claim by quoting uh, from our brief, and I think that that misrepresents our claims to some extent in a way that's important because. The, the point we're making in the brief there about longtime residents is that this case is, is, is different from Mandel and Din in an important way in that the, the federal actions here affect, uh, affect longtime residents who have been here. Now, that's not all it affects. It also affects uh, people who are trying to visit them. It affects those people trying to visit their families. It, uh, the Establishment Clause violation affects um, affects everyone in a, in a sense, in the sense that it, it uh, well, as, as the court knows, the, the case law is quite clear that establishment clause violations on their own show irreparable injury, and we, of course, believe that that claim is very strong. So uh, just on the merits, uh, the state has shown a strong likelihood of success. The federal government certainly, the states, I'm sorry, have shown a strong likelihood of success, and the federal government certainly hasn't met its burden on review of showing uh, a likelihood of overcoming, uh, yes, yes, of overcoming yes, that point. Judge Canby, as far as the uh, establishment clause claim goes, the government takes a position, I think, that that in uh, in weighing the uh, the validity of your establishment clause claim, you're confined to the four corners of the instrument. And you, what's your comment on that? Your Honor, I think the case law shows that that's wrong. I think, I think it was Judge Clifton who pointed out, uh, well, or Judge Friedland, I'm sorry, or maybe both. Uh, Kerry versus Dinn says exactly the opposite. This court's decision in Cardenia says exactly the opposite, that if, there's, uh, if the plaintiff makes plausible allegations uh, sufficiently supported of bad faith, the court can look behind uh, the, the motives. And th in those cases, just to be clear, those were cases where the the, uh, it, the case had to do with excluding an alien who uh, had never been here and had no right to be here. So, so if anything, the court should take a, a more uh, a harder look 
at the real motive in a case where there are significant impacts on people who do live here, who've been here for many years, uh, who are longtime residents and who clearly ha are entitled themselves to constitutional rights uh, of due process and equal protection, unlike in Kerry and Mandel, where really it was, uh, you know, the, 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 the rights being harmed were of the people overseas. It was their, it was their the people here who were asserting them. Well, we, we so should be very careful anything, about that. The, the assertion that the court took up the claim only because, in the case of Kerry versus Din, uh, Ms. Din was a U.S. citizen. Uh, of the number of people affected by the executive order, do you have any information as to what proportion would fit within the category of Washington residents or lawful well, permanent Your residents Honor, we, or we, people with visas? I mean, I suspect it's a small fraction. I'd make two points on that, Your Honor. First of all, we are at the pleading stage. We have not had an opportunity. We, we filed a complaint and a motion for temporary restraining order, and so for standing purposes, all the plausible allegations in our complaint are treated as true. Now, we've alleged that there are thousands of people in Washington, thousands more in Minnesota, who are originally from these countries who are not yet citizens here. Uh, we know the way the order was originally interpreted, excuse me, Your Honor, uh, defendants originally interpreted the order uh, and said that it covered lawful permanent residents. Uh, we know that there are roughly half a million lawful permanent residents from these seven countries in the United States. Now, they've changed their mind about five times about whether it applies to those people in the, in, the, in the time since the order issued, and now they say that it doesn't. But at the time the state filed its complaint, uh, they had not yet made their position clear about that, and, and I would say that that argument is not moot yet because under the voluntary cessation standard, uh, until they change the order to make that crystal clear, uh, that, that, that claim, they can't just say, well, now we say it doesn't apply to them, so don't worry about it. I mean, that's half a million people who are in the United States who uh, overnight, at least according to the government initially, lost their right to travel, to come in and out of the country, to visit their relatives. Uh, and, and several people... Position, why shouldn't we limit the order, the temporary restraining order, reach to those people who you've got a strong case for, like the LPRs? Why should, why should the temporary restraining order reach beyond that? That seemed to be the government's principal argument, that it was overbroad. Why isn't it overbroad? For three key reasons, Your Honor. Uh, first of all, limiting the order in that way would not address all the harms the order is causing. Uh, so, for example, it would not remedy the order's violation of the Establishment Clause, which harms everyone in our states, as well as our states themselves, uh, by uh, favoring a, a one religious group over another. Uh, it also would not fully remedy the order's violation of the Equal Protection Clause, because the order relies on discriminatory animus to deny some of our residents who are here the ability to receive visits from their friends and family while allowing others to receive those visits and so on. So it, it wouldn't address all the harms. Uh, the second point is that our, our, our U.S., as in DIN, the U.S. citizens who are here who are related to these folks overseas do have rights, and it would not address their rights at all to limit it that way. And then, and then finally, Your Honor, I just say that defendants have not explained how they would workably implement the narrower order that they're now proposing, which they didn't pr really propose in any way before. Uh, their approach would require some sort of system for quickly approving travel uh, and reentry by thousands of people uh, from the affected countries who live here, who study here, who work here in our businesses, and who often have to travel for work or to visit family. And they just have not credibly described how they would be able to do that, even if it were able to address all of our harms. In evaluating your establishment clause claim, should we apply Larson or Lemon? Well, Your Honor, we think we prevail under either test, but we think this case is closer to Larson because in Larson what you had was a facially neutral law. It did not mention any religious denomination by name, but it did focus on religious groups, and the result of it was to distinguish between them in a way that favored some and not others. And that's exactly what we have here. We have an order that on its face doesn't mention any denomination, but that um, is... is we have alleged, and there is strong evidence already to support, is intended to favor uh, some religious groups over others, and and that is that is exactly the situation in Larson. Now, I know the other side is saying if it doesn't mention a particular denomination on the face of the document, then Larson doesn't apply. But that's that's not what Larson itself says. Larson in Larson, the law did not mention a denomination. But again, we also think that we prevail under the Lemon Test, 
which is explained in some detail in our district court briefing. We did not, unfortunately, have space really to explain that argument as well in the briefing to this court. If we were to agree with you about Larson, is there any reason to consider your equal protection claim, or are those two claims essentially redundant? I think if you, if you agreed with us about Larson, there would not be any need to reach our equal protection claim. I think that's fair. Well, let me ask about the, I'll call just religious discrimination claim to reach both the equal protection and establishment clause claims. And, and I'm, I'm not entirely persuaded by the argument, if only because the seven countries encompass only a, I think, a relatively small percentage of Muslims. I mean, do you have any information as to what percentage or what proportion of the adherents to Islam worldwide are, are citizens or residents of those countries? My, my quick penciling suggests it's something less than 15 percent. I have not done that math, Your Honor, but and, to be and clear... Given, and given that all those countries are countries that have been previously tagged as subjects of concern about terrorism, granted it's because of perhaps radical Islam sects, so there might be a religious motivation behind the terrorism, but I have trouble understanding why we're supposed to infer religious animus when in fact the vast majority of Muslims would not be affected as residents of those nations, and where the concern for terrorism with those connected with radical Islamic sects is kind of hard to deny. Your Honor, the case law from this court and the Supreme Court is very clear that to prove religious discrimination, we do not need to prove that this order harms only Muslims or that it harms every Muslim. We just need to prove that it was motivated in part by a desire to harm Muslims. And we but have alleged you, that... How do you infer that desire if, in fact, the vast majority of Muslims are unaffected? Well, Your Honor, in part, you can infer it from intent evidence. I mean, there are statements that we've quoted in our complaint uh, that are rather shocking evidence of intent to discriminate against Muslims, given that we haven't even had any discovery yet uh, to, to, to find out what else might have been said in private. I mean, the, the public statements from the president and his top advisors reflecting that intent are, are strong evidence, as certainly at this pleading stage, uh, to allow us to go forward on that claim. And again, you know, with no, no type of discrimination claim requires you to show that, that every single person of that category was harmed by the action. The, 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 you, you just have to show that the action was motivated in part by a desire to harm that group. And well, could, that's could exactly what we've alleged. Could you point into any situation where the proportion affected were less than 15 percent? Your Honor, I'm sorry, I haven't thought about, I, as I said, I had not done that math before the, before the argument. I have not thought about the case in, that, in those terms because, well, let me because switch again, to the, the other part of it. I mean, do you deny that, in fact, there is concern about people coming from those countries, separate and apart from what their religion might be, because as Congress and the previous administration have concluded, those countries are a concern from a terrorist perspective? Your Honor, Congress... Congress had determined that those, and the, and the executive had determined that those countries, as, as I think it was you who put it, uh, should not, you know, get a waiver from a visa requirement. That is eminently different from a complete ban on travel you, to you this country. Do you that that decision by the previous administration or by Congress was religiously motivated? No, Your Honor. No, we are not okay. asserting that so at all. It would be possible to identify these countries as a source of concern and possibly as the subject of special treatment without having religious motivation or discriminatory intent behind it. Well, Your Honor, but cases like McCreary from the U.S. Supreme Court make very clear that in assessing Establishment Clause claims, an action that could have been perfectly legitimate if done with proper intent is not legitimate and is unconstitutional if done with a desire to favor one religion over another. McCreary makes that very clear. It, it literally says the exact same action could be acceptable if done for some reasons and not acceptable if done for others. And here we've alleged very plausibly with great detail uh, that this was done to favor one religious group over another. And, uh, and so we should be allowed to go forward on that claim, even though, yes, these, we, we're not denying that these countries could have theoretically and, and in fact, were previously chosen for well, some lesser level uh, It's not of, just your allegation review. at this stage. You've got to demonstrate a, a, a likelihood of success. 
So, so what is it that should lead us to conclude that you've got a likelihood of success of being able to prove the religious animus you allege? Well, Your Honor, for starters, that the president called for a complete ban on the entry of Muslims, and then, uh, and, and then, is this, is this that ban? No, we're not saying that this is a complete ban on Muslims entering the country. Obviously, I mean, they realize that, that I mean, this is, ta this is uh, I well, what his advisor said on television was that he, he was asked for a way to uh, implement a, a narrower thing that would be legal. And, uh, but, but the point is that the, that was clearly a motivating, what, what we have alleged, and again, it, yes, it is, we do have to show a likelihood of success, but at this stage, the case law is clear, our, our plausible allegations are taken as true uh, for assessing uh, that likelihood of success. And, Wait, and that cannot we, possibly be true. We are supposed to take your word for it, the fact that you make an allegation of the complaint and that equals likelihood of success? You don't really mean that, do you? Well, Your Honor, what I, what I mean is that we, we have assessed, we have you alleged. You can allege sorry, anything. Have, do I have to believe everything you allege and say, well, that must be right? That's not the standard. You, you've it? actually supported these allegations with exhibits, haven't you? We have supported many of our allegations with exhibits. Yes, uh, uh, Judge Friedland, we have, and and I do think that's uh, that's important. We have presented an enormous amount of evidence, especially considering again that we are, are the time between our filing. Our our complaint was filed uh, a week ago Monday, together with the temporary restraining order motion, together with the declarations. So so unlike cases. Uh, well, and we, we've had extraordinarily little opportunity to actually gather and present evidence in the you district know, we court. We faulted the government for exactly the same thing. Don't tell us you need more time because the government brought the stay motion. Well, don't tell us you need more time. You're the one that sought the temporary restraining order. Either you have the well, evidence it, presented in the record or you don't. I mean, that's don't don't tell us maybe you'll gather it later. If 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 you can't demonstrate a likelihood of success with what you've got in the record so far, and maybe you can. I'm not saying you can't. But so far, I haven't heard a lot of reference to, to evidence and a lot more references to allegations, and I don't think allegations cut it at this stage. Uh, we are. This we, is we, Judge we, uh, I, If the motion before us is a motion for stay, who has the burden of showing likelihood of success? At this point, Your Honor, it is the federal defendants who have to show that they are likely to succeed on appeal. We had the burden at the district court of showing a likelihood of success on the merits. But the state standard is very clear that it's the party seeking the stay that has to show a likelihood of success on appeal. And again, we believe that it would be more appropriate to treat this as a mandamus action where they would have to show a clear and indisputable right to relief. And in part, we think that because if you don't, then it's the district court's temporary restraining order uh, that, that, the, that the federal government is going to maintain is the, is the order to be appealed from ultimately. Uh, and, and that's just not proper, given that it, in neither form nor substance or, or intent was that meant to be a preliminary injunction order. It was meant to be a temporary restraining order. The district court was very clear about that. And the district court should have an opportunity to consider the preliminary injunction briefing and issue a preliminary injunction order uh, that could then be reviewed very is, soon. Is there uh, more evidence that is necessary, though? I mean, I, I think most of your claims are going to get de novo review anyway. So I don't know if we really need to wait for the district court to do more unless more evidence is going to be presented? Our point is not, well, we, we, will, we do intend to file some additional declarations and evidence in the district court if, if given that opportunity. Uh, but I think it's also important to point out just for fairness, the sake of fairness to the district court itself, uh, the district court should have the opportunity to, to enter something that it actually thinks is a preliminary injunction order uh, so that it, to assess the evidence, to have more time to it issue an order that, that's framed as and intended as a preliminary injunction order that this court re could review. And if, if I guess I'd just ask that if you, if you decide not to do that, if you decide to treat this as a, as a preliminary injunction ruling and, and a stay motion, then I'd ask you to issue an opinion that treats it like a preliminary injunction ruling and that gives it the sort of consideration that you would want that reviewed with because the other side, that the, the federal government has already made very clear that they intend to seek immediate review if this court uh, denies the stay, and uh, of course, you know it, it would be it would be unfair to this court and to the district court to have the federal government try to take to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, you know, an order that was explicitly framed as a temporary restraining order, and that the judge understandably uh, issued uh, so urgently. So, if we to were to issue a reasoned opinion, would that take care of this concern, or is there a concern beyond that? 
I think that would address much of the concern, Your Honor. I, I would ask that you do either one or the other. I mean, I do think it would be better procedurally and more, more in keeping with the court's precedent to send the case back to the district court to, 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 to find this uh, temporary restraining order to allow us to put in the evidence that we would to support the preliminary injunction motion and to allow the district court to issue a preliminary injunction ruling. But if you're not going to do that, then I, I do think a, a reasoned opinion would, would do much to address that concern. Can you tell us whether your further evidence would be more about standing or more about the merits or both? Uh, Your Honor, I think it would be primarily just slightly more uh, detail about standing at this point. Again, we haven't, we haven't uh, of course, the difficulty with a, a claim that's about intent is that we've made these allegations. Uh, we haven't had any discovery yet, and, and realistically, you know, it will take some time to gather that sort of evidence beyond public statements. And this court has held, and so has the U.S. Supreme Court, that when a case has to do with intent, you know, it, it, it's, it, well, it's very, it's remarkable to have this much evidence of intent without any discovery, I think is probably the best way to characterize it. So I think that the court should te keep that in mind in assessing likelihood of success. We've taken you down to four minutes. Is there anything you'd like to conclude with? Well, Your Honor, the other point, that I guess there's one other point I would like to make, that, of course, the, we also have a statutory claim uh, under the Immigration and Nationality Act. And uh, we, we, I mean, we believe that all of our claims are very strong, that we're likely to succeed on all of them, but that is, also, that is uh, a claim that, that we, it's, uh, we feel very likely to succeed on and that would also potentially allow the court to avoid the constitutional issues if it wanted to uh, by relying on the statutory ground. The INA section, uh, well, sorry? But the statutory ground would help us only with regard to those uh, seeking immigrant visas, is right. that correct? Uh, I, yes, Your Honor, I think that is largely correct. I think that is basically correct, that 1152 speaks of immigrant visas and, uh, and that there cannot be discrimination based on nationality in, uh, in issuing those visas. And, and so by that extension, really that would not seem us, to help I, that's us. That's not really a way to avoid all your constitutional claims, then, right? Because it wouldn't cover everything, everyone. I suppose that's fair, Your Honor. It would not necessarily allow you to avoid all the constitutional issues, but I, I guess I just don't want to lose sight of that claim. That it is, we believe it is a, a very strong claim that that the order violates the INA, and 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 also, I guess I think it's important to. I think that's an important point because it goes to what level of deference is owed to the executive. Of course, the, the, the president is claiming that he's acting pursuant to a congressional delegation of authority. And our position is, in fact, no, he's acting contrary to what Congress has said. And even if that's not as to every single member, every single person who's harmed by the order, it's an important factor to consider in deciding uh, how much deference to give to the executive on this point. Well, there have been presidential orders in the past by prior presidents that treated people based on their nation. Uh, why does why shouldn't that suggest to us that the the statute should be harmonized in a way other than the one that you're advocating? We are. All of those orders have been narrower, significantly narrower than the one here, well, and, the and included. The same though. I mean, if you single out Cubans because they're from Cuba. That's doing it by a class based on nationality, and, and I haven't heard any citation or reference to a, a legal challenge to that or an argument that, I think that one was President Reagan's, that what he did wasn't appropriate. Uh, there were others that singled out individual countries, hadn't been a challenge to that. Why should we decide that Congress, in enacting 1152, since that's the number I've been using, meant to amend or, or partially repeal 1182? Well, Your Honor, uh, two points. Number one, as you pointed out, there have not been cases about those about those issues. So there's not. Uh, while that may have been to some uh, a much narrower practice than this, there, I agree that there has been some practice to that effect, much narrower than here. Um, but but again, every one of those examples involved uh, much more narrow tailoring than we have here. And also, 1182. But the problem is the same. Can you treat people based on the nation they come from? And, and foreign policy or foreign affairs do all the time. We treat people from North Korea differently than we treat people from France. So I have trouble understanding your interpretation of 1152 as prohibiting what seems to be commonplace in foreign affairs. 
Well, Your Honor, 1182 itself includes a number of exceptions that allow uh, for uh, that allow the federal government to deem people inadmissible for security-related reasons and other reasons. Uh, it, but 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 not to make this sort of across the board without exception policy that applies to infants, to school children, to grandmothers, to people who pose no plausible threat whatsoever to to this country. Uh, so so I, I guess I just ask the court not to lose sight of that statutory claim, especially because I do think it goes it it, it, it helps drive home that that the, the court can review this order. The court should review this order. And, and should give it the constitutional and statutory scrutiny that, that it deserves. If the court has no further questions, we would ask that you, uh, well, first we'd ask that you treat this as a mandamus uh, writ and deny it. But if you're going to treat it as a motion for stay, we'd ask that you deny it and issue a reasoned opinion doing so. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Flinchy, we let Mr. Purcell go a little bit over, so uh, I'll give you five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, I just want to address a couple quick points. First, DIN. You know, whatever DIN says about looking at consular decision making does not suggest that we look behind a national security determination made by the President where that determination, the four corners of that determination, are explicitly based on a co the congressional determination that the countries at issue are of concern and does not go beyond that. You are using Din and Mandel as your main authority for the, the unreviewability. And, and so um, now you're saying those are distinguishable. I'm a little confused whether you're relying on those cases or not. We are definitely relying them on them for the limits that courts review these, th these types of issues. Uh, I'm adding that when you have the document itself, and that's the best evidence of the intent of the president, it, it relies exclusively on the calls made by Congress and the administration in 2016 about the safety concerns presented by the specific countries at issue, that is the end of the inquiry and should be. Uh, in fact, I, you know, the uh, counsel for the other side started cited this court's recent Cardenas decision, and there, uh, in describing the state of the law, the court very clearly said that Congress could have enacted a blanket prohibition on, uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, I think that it was describing Mandel, on communist aliens, and that is, uh, and here we have the, the president making a, a categorical de determination based on the identification of countries of concern, and there's so nothing strange. You answered the question that was asked earlier about what if the order said it's no Muslims, and, and you've been analogizing to uh, cases that were about people who were communists who advocated overthrow of the U.S. government, and are you saying that that the the external evidence here that is alleged that the, that the intent here was to ban Muslims is equivalent to that? If there were an executive order that prevented uh, the entry of Muslims, that there would be uh, people withstanding to challenge that, and I, uh, I think that would raise uh, uh, establishment cause, First Amendment issues. Uh, but that's not the order we have here. This order is limited to the but countries defined by Congress. And let me, on the yeah, refugee point. You are that that was the motivation, uh, and plaintiffs have submitted evidence that they suggest shows that that was the motivation. So why shouldn't the case proceed, perhaps, to discovery to see if that really was the motivation or not? We're not saying the case shouldn't proceed, but it is extraordinary for a court to enjoin the president's national security determination based on some newspaper articles, and that's what has happened here. That is not a, a, that is a, a very troubling uh, second guessing of the national security decision made by the president. And the notion that we are going to go back to the court and stop, stop, this is Judge Clinton. Do you deny that, in fact, the statements attributed to then candidate Trump and to his political advisors, and most recently, Mr. Giuliani, do you deny that those statements were made? Uh, Judge Clinton, I, I no. I, I would note that Judge Robart uh, himself said that. Uh, he wasn't going to look at campaign statements. Uh, I do, uh, and I think that what no, we... No, that's what I think. 
that's a, that's a different point. I mean, I, I understand the argument they shouldn't be given much weight, but when you say we're, we're, we shouldn't be looking at newspaper articles, let's, uh, we're, we're all on the fast track here. Both sides have told us it's moving too fast. Either those kind of statements were made or they're not. Now, if they were made, but they were made not to be a serious policy principle, I can understand that. But if they were made, it is potential evidence. It is a basis for an argument. So I just want to make sure I know what's on the table. Well, those are in the record, but I think my point is a little narrower that in the expedited procedure of a TRO, uh, taking this extraordinary uh, uh, action of, of halting this order that the president determined was in the national security interest of the United States is uh, is uh, an unwise course and it should be stayed. If, if we thought there was a problem that this is too preliminary, if we let this go forward to a preliminary injunction hearing, do you have evidence that you would present? I think we definitely would like the opportunity to present uh, evidence back, back in the district court and we uh, we also think that the, the scope can of this law is really needs to the, be. Can you, can you tell us anything about the type of evidence you would present so that we can consider that whether, whether further proceedings are needed? Not yet, but I do. But another point is the scope of the, the suit and the injunction would really need to be narrowed as the parties focus in on the actual harms. The harms that Washington has cited focus on residents of Washington, but the order goes way beyond that to the areas of the most concern of the president, people who have never been to this country yet and have no connection to Washington, no connection to the United States, and no claim of constitutional rights, either, either on their own or through Washington. If I can ask my colleagues to indulge me for a moment, that does raise a serious concern on my part. And, and in the scope of the order, uh, most obviously having to do with the, the lawful permanent residents, uh, which government's position now is they're not included within the scope of the order. Uh, I have to say, I mean, is there any legal authority for the counsel of the president to have power to to instruct the other departments or to instruct us as to what the order means? I mean, the president can amend the order, but I'm not sure that the counsel of the president has that authority. So, so, so why is it we should be looking at this reconceived order, and why is it we should, rather than try to narrowly carve out the injunction you're asking for. Those are practical problems. I don't know how I'd write such an order. Why shouldn't we look to to the executive branch to more clearly define what the order means rather than have to look through the lens of these subsequent interpretations? Uh, let me uh, make two points there. One, the, uh, the uh, guidance from the White House counsel is the definitive interpretation of the order, and the White House counsel speaks for the president in this context. Second, in our reply brief, at the very end on page 11, we had our kind of suggestion for the kind of order that would actually address the harms identified by Washington. And there, I'm going to read that. At most, the injunction should be limited to the class of individuals on whom the state's claims rest. Previously admitted aliens who are temporarily abroad now or who wish to travel and return to the United States in the future. That is the core of the harm they've identified. When we're talking about an injunction entered on such a, a preliminary basis, uh, it should be limited to the claims that the state is making and not issued uh, more broadly. If there are no further questions, uh, I encourage the court to stay the, to stay the injunction uh, or to limit it to the presentation of the state of Washington. Thank you. Thank you, counsel, for your very helpful arguments. This matter is submitted. We appreciate the importance and the time-sensitive nature of this matter and will endeavor to issue our decision as soon as possible. Thank you again for appearing on such short notice. We are adjourned. This court for this session stands adjourned.